Um, okay, thank you guys for staying so late. Uh, I think it's been very brutal, uh, but I hope that you have found it uh, interesting and useful, uh, which I have. Um, so we have got a lot of sessions in the morning, uh, not morning, I think after lunch, um, about the Google uh, Machine Language, uh, ML, the AI piece, NLP. Uh, I'm DAD, the presentation on uh, the language corpus as well as application of ML, right, or, or NLP. So I want to switch gears a little bit, right, because all of this is within that uh, GCP or the cloud platform or uh, an enterprise data center, right? It all happens there. What I want to switch gears about is actually talk about what happens to your end users at the end of the day who is going to consume the content or the application or the service. So just a quick um, advertisement uh, on Fastly. So it's a company which was actually uh, born in 2011 um, and it was actually listed about six months back. Unfortunately, I joined the company after it was listed, so I did not get any stock. So that's, that's a bummer. But I still joined the company because of the technology. Right, I'm, I'm really, really uh, impressed. So just a quick check. Does anybody know what a CDN is? Right, okay, good. Um, the rest, because I just did a poll uh, early in the morning and it seems that not a lot of people know what a CDN is. So I just do a quick, quick overview of what a CDN is as well as you know, explain uh, what the modern CDN actually looks like, right? So Fastly has got many POPs around the world. POPs means uh, points of presence, right? What it does is that it deploys um, very big servers around the globe so that you don't have to, right? So that's one. Two is that we have created new technologies um, to serve, better serve, and deliver content and applications and services. What it does is that, so think about it in, in, in the 1990s. Uh, a lot of you are very, very young, so you probably do not know what internet looks like in the 1990s, but I had dial up at 2400 BPS, uh, Hayes modem, that was terrible. And right now we have very, very blazing fast internet speeds. But during that time, the internet was relatively unstable. Peering relationship transit links between carriers were actually problematic, so you got packet loss. Quick question, who knows TCP IP rather well? TCP, great, fantastic. So you guys know, right? So between uh, two machines or two servers or a browser and, and, and uh, a, a server, a web server, you have you, the base protocol of the internet is actually TCP IP, right? You've got Sing Sing Act, you are able to, to communicate and in a reliable manner. Unfortunately, because it's a reliable protocol, um, which is good, because at that time internet was prob problematic, if there was pocket, packet loss, what it does is that it does a retry timeout. Right? So the packet on the other side will wait for three seconds and then resend the packet again, right? And based on congestion window size and stuff like that. I'm sorry, it's getting a little bit warm. Okay, so the modern servers, instead of using a traditional uh, hard disk drive, what Fastly actually did, or modern CDNs actually did, was that they use SSDs, right? Uh, solid state drives. The advantage of SSDs is the very, very high O per second, right? and you do not have moving parts and so on and so forth. Now the problem of SSDs is that they are, they are liable to fail after some time if they do extensive reads and writes. So what Fastly did um, is actually created a file system just to address that. And over the past um, 2011 to 2019, it's been really, really relatively stable with that new file system that we've actually created. So that's one. The other thing about the internet, it's, like it's quite reliable until it's not. Right? Internet itself, it's based on a network of networks. And how they actually route traffic is I via this protocol, BGP, Border Gateway Protocol. Right? It's, it's very, very good. Um, it's very lightweight protocol and which BGP routers actually transfer uh, state or, or vector-based information about which route to actually route the packet to. So, but however, it does not actually take into account load or latency. Right? So what Fastly actually did was they created, our founder actually doesn't like routers very much, right? Because it's, it's really expensive for what it actually does. So they created this thing called uh, our machines. We actually built custom BGP routing rules within the machines itself. So think about it. You are used to going through, ex example, when Sing Sing Singapore, right? You're connected to via Singtel. So Singtel is connected via Starhub. It goes to Cogen level three and then reaches Deutsche Telekom to your end user within Germany. This path is actually pretty crappy right now. 
what does it do? BGP doesn't allow you to change anything because you know it's not based on performance or anything like that. Unless the whole thing fails, then you got you 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 change the route. From here, if we know that this path is not working, via this intelligent BGP routing table, the server itself knows how to route via a different carrier, right? So that's pretty cool. I'm not sure whether so from a networking standpoint, that's a pretty pretty cool thing, right? Wait, hang on. Sorry. So how it works on the internet. So this is a quick view. Uh, Singapore, London, 250 milliseconds. It's, it's not rocket science, right? This is based on uh, physical distance, I mean physics, speed of light. It's about there, right? The other thing is because of the peering relationship between the telcos and it carries from Singapore to London. New York, 300 milliseconds. Tokyo, it's about 200 milliseconds. Again, it's based on two big factors. One, it's on physical distance, and one is carrier relationship. So in China, where the, the north is China Telecom, south is probably dominated by China Unicom, the latency within a country, it's as high as 250 milliseconds. It's not because of physical distance. It's because they don't work together, right? So, so that's a concept of the internet. The other thing is packet loss, network issue, and unknown error. So, when you think about a lot of performance um, from an enterprise standpoint, when you do ML, when you do um, various stuff, you are always thinking, or one will always think that it's within a, uh, an environment that you can control. The internet, you can't. What you're thinking about here, it's in the, in the, in the realm of microseconds or picoseconds, CPU speed, right? Unless you're doing a, bu a bunch of data processing where they take seconds or minutes. But internet, it's milliseconds at least. So those who would know, uh, older school or you're, you're familiar with uh, networking, MTU of the internet is typically 1,500 bytes, right? Data payload is 1,460 bytes. 100 kilobytes of base page, HTML page, you can divide by 1,500 bytes and you get a lot of packets. Based on congestion window and the TPIC protocol, you take six seconds or, or whatsoever to transfer 100 kilobytes if a latency is about 250 milliseconds, right? You can calculate the math. That's theory. TCPIP has improved a lot since, but it is still significant time based on this because it's a factor, um, a milliseconds is a factor longer than a microsecond, right? So, what a, how, with the country content delivery network, I mentioned you deploy POPs around the internet so that they are close to your users. Typically, if let's say there's a POP within London, it's actually connected less than five milliseconds away. What you want from a CDN is to cache as much content as possible so that your end users do not need to come back to your origin server. We call it an origin server because it just takes too, too long, right? So there's faster response times, a lot more stable. And okay, but a CDN is not all bits and roses, right? Um, In an on-prem server, right? On-prem server, as in the physical type server, um, you have you have absolute control and visibility. If something goes wrong, you can go to the machine, you delete the content, you purge the content, you change the configuration file, you look at the logs. You could do all of that. With a cloud or content delivery network, you can't. And the reason is because you to be able to control that particular piece of um, service, you need to con you need to manage multiple, multiple cloud servers around the world, right? Um, for Fastly, it's about 66 mega pops, but for some other servers, it's 300,000, 400,000 type servers. So it's incredibly difficult, and it makes sense, right? So, it's, so if you are able to delete, you, you, for, to, for you to, for a business, for example, I think it was a colleague from SPH, if they were to publish content or user-generated content, which is not good, right? You do not want, it's false, or somebody made a mistake. You want to remove that content. It's not simply going to the server and you know delete the file. It's not. You're able. You need to be able to go and purge the content across all servers, and it takes a long time, right? So that's one. Second thing, little visibility to be able to collect or collate all your logs across the multiple thousands and thousands of servers takes time. Sometimes to extent of a day. What this means is that when you deploy a configuration, deploy a uh, publish your content, you actually do not know whether it's actually working or not. 
until you receive a customer call to say, hey, I can't see your content, or there's a 404, right? <coughs> Last thing is that you have uh, limited control. To be able to change anything with the configuration, you probably have to call somebody to book an appointment, a meeting, or service request for somebody to actually change the control, uh, change the, 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 the configuration. Now, this was fine and good in the 90s and early 2000s because uh, development life cycles were SDLC, waterfall models, where you know fill in whatever feature request, and then the team takes it in and then plans the project plan. Right? After six months later, they deploy, and that's why you do it, and publish the content or, or, or the service. This used to be it. Today's world is all about DevOps and CI CD, right? You can actually publish like your microservice like 20 times a day. How, how, are, you going to, how are you going to mess around with, a, with a, a CDN configuration that takes you a long time for you to actually propagate? It doesn't make sense, right? Um, so. So the new technologies today actually um, addresses a lot of these. So first of all, I, and I think this is a game changer, you're able to purge your content um, sub-second. So if, let's say, somebody um, uploads a, 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 a crappy diagram, right, a, a, a naughty picture or whatsoever within your user-generated forum, to remove the content, you would actually typically Go to your server, delete it, and then got to go to the to the configuration to be able to purge this content. Now, and it takes time. So right now, with this, you could actually do it sub-second, everything, all the global servers. And the reason you could do this is using a bimodal multicast algorithm, which is pretty cool, right? Um, we can talk about it later on bimodal because I'm pretty excited about that. The other thing is that. The technology today allows real-time log streaming. This has two purposes. One, you give a lot of visibility back to the customer and enterprise, the organization. You're able to see when you deploy a configuration, that means to say you publish your service, you deploy a configuration, you actually know whether it's working or not almost immediately. Now, think about it in terms of many, many things. One, it's WAF. WAF is Web Application Firewall. I'll talk about it later. Right? You can have instant logs. The other thing is that flexible and real-time config change. You're able to deploy your configuration to all these thousands and thousands of servers almost immediately. It, the last we did an uh, experiment is about 13 to 15 seconds. Singapore alone is probably about less than 10, but globally it's about 13 seconds. Right? You're able to do it in 30 seconds globally, and it's all via API. Okay, now, quickly about edge security. Um, you guys already know, probably know about DDoS, right? DDoS is, it's, it's, it's a nuisance, lah. let's put it that way. There's a lot of traffic, junk traffic. The, 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 the aim is to bring down a service, right? But if you think about it, if let's say you're within behind a CDN, um, and your CDN only accepts valid HTTP, HTTPS requests at port 80 and 443, it's a no-brainer. Anything which is at layer 3 and layer 4, that means UDP floods, SYN floods, ICMP floods, everything is automatically removed or dropped. It's a perfect defense, right? Because it only listens at 80443 with a valid host header. So that's cool. The other thing is WAF. WAF is a web application firewall, right? Um, takes into account OFs, you know, top 10 type rules that you are able to protect your web service or web server. Okay, it's, you have, you, you, those who haven't had it should have a WAF, right? But the problem of a WAF is that it's a single, it's a bottleneck of request. So if somebody wants to DDoS you, they DDoS your WAF, and then you're dead, right? So then the concept is it's a cloud WAF. You bring it out, and you have a lot of WAF to be able to defend you. But the challenge is, again, the same challenge of an edge or a cloud-type um, um, defense mechanism, which is you have limited visibility, and configuration change takes a lot longer, right? Um, well, the new technology is that because I just mentioned, right, you've got instant purge, instant configuration, and instant locks. You're able to manage your cloud WAF as if it's an on-prem WAF with the benefits of a cloud WAF. This is, uh, this is really important. 
Couple of other load application, H applications, which I think it makes a lot of sense. It's actually load balancing. Now, if you want to load balance within, let's say, a data uh, uh, enterprise or cloud, you know, different microservices, that's cool. But if you want to step a, take a step out, from an end user standpoint, right, a consumer or your customer, be it wherever they are, if the further you are from that particular service to do load balancing decisions, it's a lot better. Reason is because of networking. From here to that particular service and here to particular service, I know the traffic conditions. Versus if you are a lot closer, you have less visibility and intelligence, right? That's why from a load balancing standpoint, it's best to be as far away from a particular service as possible. Image optimization. This seems there's a lot of image optimization technologies out there, whether they are in a data center or in a cloud and stuff. But if you think about it, if the image optimization uh, technology or the, the product of the image optimization is nearer to the end user, there's a lot less um, time needed. So for example, sir, if let's say there was a, okay, assuming you're an image optimization engine, right? And, and you're, you're the end user. If you are to retrieve a content from him, and he's like a thousand of them, right? They, they're able to generate the perfect image meant for your device uh, in a correct resolution and correct size. Isn't it a lot faster than versus coming to me, which is your central cloud or your data center? It just makes a lot of sense. And uh, the, the, once he delivers an image to you, he cached a particular size of image and resolution, and from the, consequently, everybody gets it from him, cached, which is less than five milliseconds away, right? This is a, a use case that we have done where um, customers actually um, have an on-prem type environment and they want to move to GCP. So you have, you're actually able, I mentioned the, the H load balancer concept, but it's similar. You're able to use the Fastly or the H network to be able to slowly um, transition your traffic without any problems at all to a GCP type um, environment, okay? I have uh, with me Atsushi. Atsushi is a systems engineer from Japan. Uh, he'll walk through some actual code of VCL um, for you guys. Thank you. Come. Oops. Okay, so let me quickly introduce uh, what. To okay. Thank you. Okay. No. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let me quick, quickly introduce what our configuration VCL like and how to test and how to deploy the code to our platform. Okay. So before diving into the our actual code, so here is a Varnish request workflow. So Varnish has a state machine and then um, there are the subroutines. And so starting from uh, VCL receive, which is when our server receives the request from uh, end user, and then if our server check if it's already on hash, uh, our cache or not. And depending on the route, we, we will go to the cache hit or cache miss. Cache, uh, VCL miss means that there is, there is no cached object for the request. And then get the request from origin and the VCL fetch and VCL deliver, uh, which is where it's uh, delivering the actual object to the end user. After that, we send the log. So this is a basic of the request workflow of Varnish. Okay, so let's start with a very simple code. So in this code, first one is in other VCL receive, which means you know, this code runs when we receive the request from an end user. So as I commented, so at this other new custom header, which is a x new header equal true. So with simple this code, you know, this other, this header to the request from an end user. And the second line is a modify existing header. So you, we can override existing header as well. So in this example, overriding a user agent to my test user agent. And the third code is under VCL deliver, which means you know, we modify the response headers from our server to end users. 
And this is unset HTTP server header. So we just remove this header from the response from our server to end user. And let me show our test tool. So, Oh, how can I? Okay, so it seems I need to leave from, yeah. So this is the first refedor, which is uh, our uh, configuration test tool. Which that is interesting because this is a VCL, uh, CDN configuration, but we still have a developer test tool. So you can put your origin server, so whatever it's, you can use your actual web server, and you can put a VCL code here. And this is each subroutines. And then you can also set a path, and you can change the method. And you can also put uh, the header information here. You can even put the request post body here. And then you can, if you click the run, so then Firstly, deploy this code into our network and actually send the request, and it will show the actual request header and all the re information related to the request. So let's see each code. So in this code, we receives receive set x new header equal to. So this is the re uh, request header from end user to Firstly. So there is no x new header because you know this header is not in the included in the rest request from end user. However, we be, because of this code, we add this header from our server to your origin server. So yeah, th so basically this simple one line, code, line of code add this header, and the same happened to the user agent. So the user agent from end user to first server is Mozilla and blah blah blah. It's a long user agent, but we override the user agent. So the user agent f header from first to origin server is my test user agent. And then this is a delete response header from response uh, from response for the response header. So you see that. Sorry, I missed. Yeah. So you see the server information from the response from the origin to firstly. But for some reason, you may want to you know, delete or you know close the origin server information. So if you add this one line of code. And it will, there is no server header information from Firstly to Edge Server, uh, Firstly to Client. Okay. All right. So this is very simple sample. And, but you can also add uh, some you know, condition to the uh, virtual code. In this case, so we, when we receive the request from end user, we check the user agent. And depending on the user agent and check the strings in the user agent, we set x is mobile true or false. And you can also add a multiple condition to the request. So condition. So the, however, if cook, the request has a cookie desktop mode equal, equal one, it always go to the else conditions. Okay. For the sake of time, I, I'll skip the, the, the test tool for this. So you can also rewrite the URL. So when we, we, no, when we receive the request from end user, we can check the requested URL. And then if matches the conditions, we can override the request URL. So yeah, you can directly change the, the request to get content without changing the request URL to the end user. So we can also uh, configure multiple backend as Zek demonstrate uh, explained so we can put multiple backends for in this in this simple code so it just check the url and then go to decide to go which backend to go but you know you can also set up failover or you know percentage or random lobbying or you know we have a multiple type of uh, <coughs> method to choose the which backend to go all right and also, so we also have a you know, geo information. So you can get the geo information from our data set. So this is very interesting because it just go to the VC uh, error in the VC receive, which means we, when we receive the request, we go to, we send the request to the error routing and then create the response at our server and send the response to the 
client with uh, this geo client information. So this is basically the API service. We receive the request and this we return the JSON format response to the client. What is interesting for this sample is there is no origin server. We just receive the request from end user and return to the client. So this is a true serverless application. Right. Actually, we have a bunch of you know, uh, sample code like this in our web website. So let me show. I can't find my mouse. Okay. Yeah, so in our website, we have a lot of sample code. And if you click one of them, yeah, actually a lot of. I don't understand how many. So if you click one of them, you can go to the, our test tool and you can actually test the behavior. And you can also copy this, clone this. And you can modify your code, and you can test, and you can you can you know create your own code for your benefit. Okay, do we have a, still have a time? <coughs> okay. <coughs> okay, please let me j quickly demo our product. So. So this is just a very simple website. Uh, this page is refreshed automatically every one second. But however, so this was on catch. So this shows uh, the when the initial request go to the origin server. And now this page is refreshed, but you know, it's delivered from our cache server. But we can patch this in the very real time. OK. So we can patch content from via UI or via, via API code a command. So if I send this request, the, this date should refresh. Try. Yes. So I will try again. Yeah. So it's almost instant. It's maybe, you, if you're not familiar with CDN, it's very, what's great. But you know, if you know about the CDN, it's a very, very exciting. So it's a game changing. Also, so you can, you can create a configuration very easily. So this is our UI. So you can create a configuration at the, via UI here. And it will generate a VCL code like this. This is all about our configuration. But you are, if you are tech enough, you, know, you, want to, you, don't want, you don't like a UI. I know, I don't like UI. So. You can write your own code with uh, using uh, this snippet. So, for example, you can write your own code directly, and you can upload this code into our VCR, which is easier and more powerful and flexible. Okay, so let me try how long it will take to deploy the code. So, okay, okay, this is just a name. So I will I want to block the access from Singapore now. And uh, so you can also choose the response code. You can choose the 200 with, without a content, or you can put response 204, or 404, or 403, whatever you can choose. Okay, so you can also write a HTML code here. Okay, so this is very simple one, but you know, you can write a body and the information here and just create. But now, there's no condition. So all requests to this service you know, causes error. So I will attach the condition. So I already prepared this condition. So which is geo country code equal SG. And if my IP is not on fight list, then response that response send that response. Okay, let me activate this. So normally, it typically take like a 10 to 15 seconds. 
So this is now refresh automatically uh, one second. So it should be blocked sometime soon. Yeah, so and then also you see the content I created. So this is also, if you are not familiar with CDN, this is nothing, but you know, if you are familiar with CDN, uh, if you know CDN, that is very fast. Yeah, okay. <coughs> Okay, so let me quickly touch on the log. This is the last so. Okay, so we can create a log. You can send the log in real time. We have a lot of prefix endpoint. You can also we can also send a your server via syslog. And um, my sample config has a two log endpoint. So you can also set a condition to send the log. So you, maybe you, you want to receive all log or you want to receive log when it's error, like a 304 or 500. And then you can also customize the error uh, log format. For this, for the log to the small logic endpoint, I made uh, this JSON format log, and you know, it includes a lot of information related to the request. So it's very easy to customize. You just can add a variable to the, this log information. And then this is the log dashboard. Oh. So this is the sample dashboard I created from the log information I send. So this is the uh, small logic. So you can create whatever dashboard you want. And the good thing about this is you can customize it, and also it's a real time. So you can you know you can create whatever report you need to you know, to report to your boss or to check the uh, your service status or everything. Yeah. Okay, let's get back to the presentation. <coughs> okay, so it's very close to end. And uh, so we have a free developer's account. So all I demo today can be accessed via free developer's account. You know, when you access to the first three site, you, you, always, you always see the sign up in the top right corner. And then you, you just need to file the name and email and phone number, and you can create a test account. So if you have a interest, please, please, please try and touch and then contact us. All right, thank you.